portion of the skin behind the left ear, that left ear can also be cut while this wound is taking place. For the record, Your Honor, basically, Dr. Lachman. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. He put himself back in the same position he was in for the original demonstration concerning that injury number two, and then was pointing out uh, in relationship to where the ruler was being held, where the ear was in contact with what would be the sharp edge <coughs> of the knife. Yes. Doctor, from looking at uh, what you've described as injury number four, this cut, uh, are you able to determine that it was in fact inflicted before death? Yes. How can you make that determination? Because of the appearance. And would it be accurate to assume that it is not a fatal uh, sharp force injury? That is correct. Does it have any significance to you other than as a factor in assessing a likely circumstance for injury number two to have been inflicted? Does it have any significance beyond that to you on any of the issues you've considered? No. Is that injury number four described by Dr. Golden in his original protocol? Yes, he has. Has he diagrammed that particular injury anywhere? Yes, he has. Is it addressed anywhere in the addendum? No. In your judgment, was there any reason that it needed to be addressed in the addendum? It need not be addressed in the addendum because it is accurately described and diagrammed. Now, again, before we go to the protocols and so forth, you also were mentioning something about how injury number two um, is laying over another injury, which as looking at photograph G51 and perhaps even better in G53, there appear to be two um, lines, for lack of a, a better uh, lay term, which are on either side of the scraping area of skin that is a part of injury number two. You did testify regarding those earlier? Yes, I said that there was a cut which was uh, pre-existent to this sharp force injury behind the left ear. Doctor, how are you able to say that this was a cut that was pre-existent to injury number two? Because if you see the, uh, the cut, you can see that this other cut cut, this pre-existing cut, and you can see the uh, uh, depth of the cut in the margin of this wound. And is that something that you're trained to look for? Yes. In an effort to figure out whether one wound came first or second? Yes. Why is it, doctor, in looking at it that it appears, I'll withdraw the question, is it accurate to say that this part, which is the part about midway down from where you indicated this sharp force injury begins and where you indicated it ends and is on the right side as one looks at the injury in the photograph G53 and this other side, this smaller uh, line which is on the lower uh, portion of the injury but on the left side as you look at it, how can you say that's one, that was one injury that was pre-existing? You've talked about why it's pre-existent. How can you tell it was a single injury? Because of the complex nature of the sharp force injury behind the left ear and the ripping of the skin, the cut edges have been displaced. If you put the edges back together, you will see that they are one continuous cut. And there is a crime scene, uh, I think crime scene photograph, one of the autopsy photographs which I have reviewed, which shows it in line. And doctor, is again, this the kind of thing that you're trained to look for and to do? that is try and put these wounds together to see whether these uh, arise as a single wound or in fact are independent wounds. That is correct. Now is this um, wound given a designation by you in one of the photographs? I gave it as injury number three in G51. So we're back down here and again it's not as clear there but you have included both sides as the injury number three? Yes. From what you've already told us, is it your opinion that that occurred before death? Yes. In your opinion, is that a non-fatal sharp force injury? Yes. Can you, can you tell us anything, doctor, from its appearance or any of the other information you've gained knowledge of from your review, the manner in which that injury was inflicted? That's the kind of injury which is a superficial cut. It could be from uh, when the knife was being uh, wielded. Uh, 
and uh, there's partial contact of the skin surface to the tip of the knife. So whereas, where, wherein you only get a superficial cut and it doesn't have any specific pattern to it like we saw on the two superficial wounds in the front of the neck where I was able to opine that there was some control over the victim at that point. But here it's a random uh, superficial cut which could be just from wielding and portion of the knife striking the victim during the dynamic process of the altercation. Doctor, did Dr. Golden uh, address in any fashion this injury number three in his original protocol? Yes, he did. Did he diagram that injury number three anywhere in any of the available forms? He did. Is it addressed anywhere in any of the addenda? No. In your judgment, was there any need to do so? No. Why not? He has accurately uh, described it. We've covered, uh, let's see, injury number one, injury number two, injury number three, and injury number four of G51. Is that correct, doctor? Yes. Why don't we, uh, in the time that we have, try and get those four taken care of with the uh, protocols, the addendums, the diagrams, if that's okay with you. Frank. Taking care of injury number one, I believe, have we not, doctor? Yes, we have. And we've, uh, to some degree, talked about injury number two, especially in relationship to the addendum. But um, where, to make sure we have <coughs> covered it in an entry on the protocol, is there the reference by Dr. Golden to injury number two, this complex wound you've described under the left ear of Mr. Goldman? It's described better in the addendum than in the main report because in the main original autopsy report, as you recall, Dr. Golden described that particular wound behind the left ear as part of the wound which was in the left neck. Doctor, before we get to the, the actual entry, is there any way that you can understand medically how that determination could have been made by Dr. Golden? Well, he, he felt that the wound to the left neck exited, came out in the, behind the left ear and also caused a cut in the left ear uh, itself. And he felt that together they could be six inches in length. And that was his original opinion in the original protocol. Before you go further, let's see if we can identify where in the original protocol he makes that kind of uh, entry. He says that uh, the direction of the sharp force injury is upward, front to back, and the total length of the wound is approximately four inches. Now, is that referring to the injury number one of G37? Yes. And uh, uh, now, if you continue, actually, it's uh, we should start here. All right, you want to back up? Yes, please? paragraph number one, page four. It says here that the wound path went through the skin subcutaneous tissue, sternocleidomastoid muscle, transection of the left internal jugular vein with hemorrhage, dark red purple, and the direction is upward, slightly front to back four inches approximately, and it exits in the post auricular area. All right. Is that where we're going to find the beginning of what you interpret as Dr. Golden's description of this injury number two? Yes. Let me start there with a blue line uh, over that area, and I'll let you continue. And he says that uh, gaping stab incised wound, which has undulating wavy borders, but is not serrated. Intersecting the wound at right angle is a superior, inferior, two-inch interrupted superficial incised wound involving only the skin. Is that injury number three? Yes. Let me, in blue, outline that area, and I'll write 
C-51, INJ number three. All right. And then it continues here. And he says that the length of the wound path to this one is four inches. He repeats that. Okay, before you go further, let me just finish outlining the first part of the description. And I'm going to put a red over the original blue for that very small area in the first paragraph of page four. And I'll write out at the side G-51 INJ number two. Is that correct? That's, that is to reflect what Dr. Golden is in fact referring to that you believe is injury number two. Yes. All right. Now, where does he pick up with injury number two? He actually, he doesn't uh, address it further here except to say that he describes injury number four, which is a cut to the left ear, three-fourth inch cut. Point out what portion deals with injury number four. Three, uh, line four, paragraph three, page four. However, there is a three-fourth inch cut, I mean, three-fourth inch in length, linear cutting incise wound to the top or superior aspect of the pinna of the left ear. And I'll outline that area in red. <coughs> and that is G-51 INJ number four. And then he says that a straight metallic probe placed through the major sharp force injury shows that the injury to the superior part of the ear can be aligned with the metallic rod, suggesting that the three injuries are related. Let me stop you, doctor. In lay terms, what has Dr. Golden described? He says that he put a metal rod through the metal rod through the wound behind the ear, and this wound in the left neck, they all share a common path which can also be related to the cut in the left ear. When you say uh, they share a common path in lay terms, they're in a straight line? Yes. <coughs> and he says it's, the rod suggests that. The rod, the metallic rod that he's putting through? Yes. All right. If you'll continue on. And he says that path is six inches up to here, this point. That length of that path is six inches. So from what Dr. Golden has indicated on this particular entry, he has expressed a view that what you start out with as injury number one of G51, what you have as injury number two of G51, and what you have to the ear as injury number four of G51, were all the product of the knife going in where, where injury number one begins, the knife going through and exiting the ear where you believe the beginning of injury number two actually exists, exiting the head and cutting the ear in the area of the pina as indicated from the photograph and Dr. Golden's description. Is that what, in essence, Dr. Golden has said? In the original report, yes. Doctor, other than they're all in a straight line, medically, does any of that make sense? To me, my opinion was different. That wasn't my question, it Doctor. It didn't make sense to me. Medically, to you, does that make sense? No, it didn't make sense to me. Would you describe Dr. Golden's interpretation of what those three injuries reflect as a mistake? Yes. In your opinion, is that mistake one of significance as to cause of death? No. Why not? Uh, because the cause of death would still be the same because the jugular vein is injured and the cause of death is due to the bleeding of the vessel. As to the manner of death? No. Why not? Because this is a homicide. It is a death in the hands of another. That really doesn't change with the interpretation of this wound. Whether a single single-edge knife, six-inch blade approximately, caused all injuries one, two, and four? It does, uh, it does not change my opinion on that either. Why not? Because as I told you earlier, these wounds are complex. You cannot, it could, it could be a single-edge knife and you cannot exclude a double-edge knife. With respect to the amount of bleeding one would expect? 
It doesn't change that either because the jugular vein, as I told you, is a big vessel in the left neck and it will cause bleeding and it won't change anything as to the effect of the bleeding from the description of these wounds. With respect to how long Mr. Goldman lived from the time those three injuries were inflicted? Again, that won't have an effect because of the physiological process of bleeding and shock is totally different from the interpretation of the injuries, which is what has been wrong here. From any other big ticket issue that you have reviewed? No other uh, uh, effect. Including whether one person is responsible for killing Mr. Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson? That's correct. Why not? Because one person could have done the same injuries as I see it, and the, that doesn't, uh, that, that will not be reflected by the appearance of these injuries. Let's do the addendum in the short time that we have left, and we can pick up the diagram later if necessary. Doctor, you've already told us a bit about how the addendum. Starts here. It's page four. Sorry. Page two, item four. Page two, item four. So where we have this outlined in red, should we also add now and G51 injury number two? Yes. You're looking at me like I yep. didn't quite catch that one. Yep. Actually, injury number two is better described on page three. All right. part that we've already outlined. Is this a change with respect to injury number two? Uh, no, second paragraph, page three. And you, with uh, the word dissection discloses that this wound path communicates or connects along the tissue plane with a sharp forced wound of the left, left posterior auricular region, which is gaping and has undulating or wavy borders, particularly on the anterior aspect. After approximation of the edges, it measures two inches in length, and the inferior end is tapered or pointed. The superior end has a semicircular configuration measuring seven eighths by <coughs> one half inch. The two sharp force injuries communicate along the tissue planes and are separated by a length of four inches. That's the discussion of injury number two? Yes. Doctor, in your opinion, does that accurately reflect the true circumstances of injury number two. Yes. This next entry deals with injury number three. Is yes. It? So this is, I'll mark out in blue, this is G-51 INJ number three. Yes. And then back to this item five, <coughs> The opinion that had originally been expressed by Dr. Golden, in essence, that this was one sharp force injury, one, two, and four, one sharp force injury, is now changed to read as it is in item five? Yes. These sharp force injuries of the neck are fatal as they are associated with transection of the left internal jugular vein with hemorrhage. Though they share common areas of injury, they appear to be separate wounds. In your opinion, is that an accurate opinion to reflect the true circumstances that exist between injury number one and injury number two of photo G51? Yes, that is my opinion. <coughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take our uh, recess at this time, and we will not reconvene with you until... Monday afternoon. Uh, some of the parties have other commitments, and so we'll start. We'll be in recess until 1.30 on Monday. Please remember, that means you can sleep in Monday morning. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Don't discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not form any opinions about this case. Do not conduct any deliberations till the matter has been submitted to you, and do not allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. All right, have a pleasant weekend. We'll see you Monday morning. Excuse me, Monday afternoon at 1.30. Let me see Ms. Clark, Mr. Darden, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran with the court reporter, please. please